A pleasant journey to Neko. You and your friends have decided to journey to the Antarctic harbor of Neko in hopes of seeing the cute penguins living in the backdrop of the stunning glacier landscape. Aww. Yeah. To get to Neko smoothly, you each try to map out the stops along your journey in order to see the most penguins. Your chances improve the farther your ships travel, the more harbors you visit, and the more goods you deliver. But avoid doing things that interfere with the Antarctica ecology and cause the penguins to move away. Will you be the one that sees the most penguins? We wish you a pleasant journey to Necco. Aww. Isn't that sweet? <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. Seriously, penguins? Penguins are awesome. Yeah. Right? For sure. So, all right. That said, a moment here before we get started, everybody. All right. So, here we go. A pleasant journey to Necco. So, A Pleasant Journey to Neko is a dice strategy game. Plays over four rounds across two periods, with each period ending with a scoring phase. In each round, players are going to roll <gasps> and draft their dice, which are used to exchange resources, activate existing card abilities, or bid on more cards. Players can also take a number of free actions, including exchanging resources, adjusting their dice, buying and moving ships, and opening harbors to build more shipping lanes. After four rounds and final scoring, player with the most penguin points wins the game. So penguin points, i.e. victory points. Very thematic, very cute. I appreciate it. So what are you guys looking at? Oh, first off, we have the main board. We have the, the majority of the board is covered by the card display for the current round cards to be bid upon. So with this being a four-player game, there are going to be all 12 spots available. This is the advanced variant, if you will. These three cards, which are in-game scoring cards, which cost more money, etc., etc., but that's it. That's the only difference on that. So as I said, on the right side, we have the advanced game. There's only going to be these three in the game. There are plenty more available, but those three are the ones that we, quote-unquote, randomly selected before the game started. Then over on the left-hand side, you have kind of a little uh, turn order track or a a a player aid, if you will. Then below that, we have the end of period mid-game scoring tiles. So the first period, which is two rounds, the second period, which is also two rounds. Down below that, we have the discarded dice area, and then we have the victory point track, which snakes its way up the board. We're probably, at least some of us, are going to score more than 50 points, so you just wrap around in that case. Off board, we have a number of things that you guys are looking at. At the very top there, we have the period one and period two card decks. The cards that you already see out there are the period one cards. Then over here, we have additional ships, which we're going to be adding to our harbors, which we're going to be additional car uh, harbors. We're going to be adding harbors as well. More ships and harbors may be added to your player tableau to allow uh, for more growth. So you can see here on Christopher's, he has one ship and one harbor here, and then he can build more towards him as he goes along. Then we have different resources at the bottom of the screen here. You can see we have goods and we have fuel tokens there. We have some more at the top of the board for the fellas on that side. Then we have interference tokens. Interference tokens are bad. You do not want these. If you do get them, you want them gone by the end of the game, all right? Then we have the bank. We're actually using the in-game money because I'm going to be honest, I like the texture of it. It's got kind of a plastic finish on it. It's nice. So tens, fives, and ones. So we have an off-board bank as well. Then we have the starting bonus tiles. You only see those at the very beginning of the game. They're just something to jumpstart players. Um, and then after that, they'll be out of the game. And then there are dice reward tiles, these pink discs that players may be getting as we go along. We have the turn order cards as well, but over on our player tableaus, as you see here. Now, something I want to point out. The game comes with 24 of these blue dice, but for the stream and the stream only, we actually added player color dice for this just to make it easier for you guys at home to be able to track everything. So that said, normally you would just be using these six dice, okay? Obviously, we have a player board here which shows the different phases of each round and what you can do. We have a holding area for your dice up here at the top, a holding area for your eight fish that you may get. You also have a 
fish, supply of eight fish in your color. <laughs> and then a holding area here for fuel and goods. Notice also there is a maximum of eight at any one time. As I said, the six dice, although we're going to be using these for most of the game, you'll see why we actually have two sets. Again, it's just for the stream tonight. Everybody has overview cards here, and they're double-sided as a player aid. And there's another overview card that also doubles as a player order card and shows mid-game and end-game scoring as well. As I pointed out with Christopher, everyone starts with one harbor and their starting ship as well. And, as I mentioned, the fish supply, you start with zero fish. All right. So, the, as I mentioned earlier, the game plays over two periods, two rounds per period, four phases per round. So I know it's a lot of numbers, but it's very procedural. It all makes a lot of sense. After each period of two rounds, there's going to be that mid-game scoring here, and there are a bunch of these, but we just randomly selected these four out there. After the second mid-game scoring, we're going to go into final scoring. Whoever has the most penguin points wins. However, before we can go through how to play the game, I think it's important to be able to cover some concepts about the game first, starting with the card anatomy. So all of these different cards, all right? So let me go ahead and switch over to the Tableau Cam, and, and I will show you this. So there are seven different colors of cards in the game. Each has a different benefit. So the yellow cards, and we're looking at the background down here, these have coin income on them, which is their general thing. Then the green ones have fuel income on them. The light blue cards give a card discount. So every time you oh, pay your winning bids, you're going to pay less if you have any of these in your harbor or your tableau. Then there are darker blue, kind of an aqua color here, which are resource exchange, as you can see there. Then there are pink cards, which are dice enhancements. Orange cards, which are obje objectives, but also spaces for goods in which to place. These are port cards. Then there are various different brown cards with special abilities, or think of them kind of as rule breakers, if you will. So those are the seven types of cards that are going to be in this game, okay? We, they will convey different bonuses, different abilities, as I just went over. Now, let's go ahead and go over specifics on cards, okay? So I'm going to put a couple of these out here to be able to show the different types of things that there will be in a different card there. So, starting at the top left, some cards you'll see have an interference icon on these. These are going to cost victory points at the end of the game, if you have any, based on that chart that we have right there. So anytime you win this card and you add this to your tableau, you're going to get a interference marker with it. Yay, lucky you. Now let's go ahead and move down and talk about these spots here, which are hubs, okay? When you acquire cards, you're going to be placing them out here in your harbors, but we'll go talk about that in a little bit. But I want to talk about these spaces specifically. So each of these cards has a left and a right edge space on it. So let's just separate it and look at just this card here. The left side edge is a resource or money, so you'll see times two money this shows. The right edge is a die value which multiplies the left edge card that it's paired up with. So this being a one pip or one value, if this were to meet up like this, that means anytime a die or a ship hits this spot, you will get one fuel. That makes sense? Yep. Whereas if these two were paired up here, two times two money, whenever you place a two value die or a ship there, you will get four money. Does that make sense? This is a really important concept in this game. Does that, is that clear? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Your ships are actually going to start over here and they're going to go down the shipping lane as we go along, okay? So they're going to travel through hubs and every time they land on a hub, they're going to immediately gain whatever that benefit is. And as I mentioned, you may also place dice onto these locations. The die value that you can place on these locations must match exactly what that is. That does not mean if I place a four here, I'm going to get $8. No, no. You're going to place a two value die here and a two value die only. 
a one value, one value, and the cards range from what I can remember from one to three, okay, for hubs specifically. Any questions about those? No. Nope. Right? Yeah. Some cards have a middle, like this one, which is a, a, a middle hub, so again, a one value die, you'll get one fuel there. Some cards have in the lower middle an activation space. You're going to notice that this is not in the shipping lane. It's actually subset down below it. This is different than a hub as ships will not pass through the space. They only move in a straight line left to right here. This shows also an icon what phase that space can be activated. So to give you guys a couple of other examples, you'll see that this one says during the uh, action phase, the meat of the game, this says at bidding resolution. And this one here says during income, you're going to get some added benefit as well, okay? So it shows what phase the space can be activated and the benefit to that. Whereas this, during the action phase, it shows some kind of prerequisite, a minimum four pip die, meaning a four, five, or six value die will then convey whatever that bonus is on that card. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yep. All right. Continuing our, our path through the various uh, anatomy of cards, this orange card now here, this also, these port cards, have cargo spaces. That's these spaces down here in the dotted lines. You're going to have room to be able to move from goods from here under these spaces there. All right. These must be filled top to bottom, left to right. And then when they're filled, those goods will never leave that card. They're going to act or allow you to score that amount of victory points at the end of a game. Okay. Does that make sense? There is a card name at the bottom left of it. So this one, again, called a port. The five here shows how much the cost is for the winning bidder if they wish to purchase the card. And again, any victory points that may or may not be on that card. For instance, this card here conveys zero points. This one will convey two points at the end of the game. It's important to note that these victory points that may or may not be down here only get if a ship has traveled through that card. Okay, so if this card this has traveled to there, I will not be getting those two victory points at the end of the game, but as long as that has made it over to there, you will get those victory points. For port cards, it has a little lock symbol here, meaning all of these port spaces or good spaces must be filled and a ship must go through the card, at least as far as here, to be able to unlock those victory points. Is that clear? That's yes. pretty much the yep. entire anatomy of cards. Mm -hmm. Okay? All right. So we've already actually kind of covered harbors and ships, but let me go ahead and touch on that as well. So if I have cards like so. So each player starts with one ship and one harbor open. Harbors have five slots for cards, as you can kind of see at the bottom of the player tableaus, or the player boards there. You pay an ascending amount of money for additional harbors. So if I were to get an additional harbor to put card then, and forgive me for, it would be, these wouldn't overlap like this. So I would actually have a second harbor that allows me to place up to five more cards down below it. There is a maximum of five harbors per player. So in theory, you could have as many as 25 cards, although realistically you're probably going to be in the neighborhood of 6 to 10 normally. A harbor does not need to be complete before additional harbors are purchased and opened and to put more cards on. So for instance, if I this isn't complete, I could even have something like this and I could start building the harbor down below here as such. Okay. Once a card is acquired, either through bidding or through other means, it must go into any open slot on a harbor. So right now, if I only have my first harbor open, I have five places, if this is the card that I won, to place. If it goes into the far left most, uh, the far left open available spot, it is free to be able to place it there. However, for every spot to the left where there's a gap, you're going to pay one coin. So if on a previous turn, maybe I had placed this card here, and for whatever reason, I want to place this, say, here, there is one gap to the left of it, ergo, I'm going to have to pay $1 to be able to place it there. However, if I had that second harbor 
open here and I wanted to place it there even though there's all these empty spots that's okay because this is the leftmost empty spot ergo you don't pay any money any questions on that no nope. nope. all right you can purchase more ships to travel harbors so every ship that you have when you get a card over on the far left space will start on that far left space however the rule is one ship per harbor per open harbor so if for example there I have two open harbors now that means each shipping lane may have a total of two ships on it ships start in the leftmost space on the far first far left card and you have to pay fuel to be able to move them to the right you're never going to move ships back to the left and they gain resources as shown on complete hubs so if I were to move this ship over here this is not a complete hub I would not get any benefit for moving that ship there other than possibly mid game points up here but if this were here and I paid the fuel to move it this shows that I would get four dollars anytime so boom as soon as I get that I would get four dollars for that as I said you can move to half filled hubs and even on a subsequent turn, if I were to come in and get this card and add it in after the fact, the ship was already there, I do not get what the bonus was. Whereas if I waited, now I move the ship, now I'm going to go ahead and get one fuel to place into my fuel reserves. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm not trying to over you know, drive this point home too, too much, but this is these, these are the two core concepts of this game. If I had acquired another ship, and this one had moved along to here, and I went ahead, I chose to put it there, I paid the fuel to move it there, I would get that benefit, and I choose to move a ship there, I would then get the benefit again for doing so. You can have multiple ships, there is no limit to the number of ships that can occupy the same space other than that original rule, which is based on how many open harbors, that's how many ships you can have in a shipping lane. All right. It's going to score, each ship is going to score victory points uh, on each mid-game scoring based on the different distance traveled, one, two, four, seven, or zero. And once a ship has reached the far right of a harbor, so if we had played some cards and one of these ships made it there, it's going to stay there till the end of the game where it's going to score seven points, okay? And maybe any additional points for end-game scoring that there may be. So, now that these concepts are understood, let's go ahead and go through the anatomy of how a round works and go ahead and get playing. So, phase one is shown right here. It's called the mar morning market phase. If you have, and this is in player order, in turn order, so in this case, if I were the first player and let's say I had some number of fish over here in my, fish, in my freezer, I can discard any number of fish that I wish Fish that I wish. <laughs> uh, back to my supply, and I could get four money, two fuel, or one good. Money just goes off, as you can see here, whereas fuel and goods, your maximum eight here in your storage facility. Pretty simple. Mm -hmm. The only limit is the number of fish. Every player has eight fish, so you can never have more than eight fish there. You, if you had eight fish, you could turn it in for 32 bucks or 16 bucks and a bunch of fuel, however you want to mix and match. Any questions on that? Good, we're moving on, that's simple. Phase two is the preparation phase. Now the preparation phase has a number of steps. The first thing that's going to happen is we're going to draft dice. So in this case, and this is for the stream only, we're going to roll our six dice and let's say I went ahead and rolled these six dice. Everybody's going to simultaneously roll them. Then they're going to choose one of these to keep and let's say maybe I choose to keep this six here then we're going to pass all of their dice over to the next player where they're going to choose one and we're all going to be simultaneously passing around the table until everybody ends up with six dice that they have chosen and drafted all right keep doing it until all six dice are there at that point and again this is stream only we're then going to set all our colored dice in our player color to whatever those numbers are. So I would have one, two, three, four, six, six. And then at that point, these six dice will go away because that was just for that step for us. Normally everyone has blue dice. Okay, not to belabor the point. Next, 
we're going to go into the inc uh, uh, obtain income step, which is in turn order, we're going to discard one of these six dice to the dice discard area and get the pip value in cold, hard, cash. So maybe I discard this four. That four will come over here to the discard area and I will get four bucks added to my eight. Pretty simple. Everybody's going to do that in turn order. Then any cards that are in a player's harbor that shows uh, during obtain income step also conveys their bonuses now. So if that were the case, let's say I just had this one that has the obtain income. I have one green card. It, would say, it says I also get two fuel, meaning I then would also get two fuel as well as the four bucks that I would have gotten from obtaining income. Good. Moving on. Next is getting reward. So now we're going to put these five dice that every, everybody has on their player board onto their player board as such. And in turn order, players are going to compare the lowest value die that they have to this chart over here. And they're going to select one reward based upon the lowest value die or higher. So let's say for argument's sake, my lowest value die is a three. In that case, that means these two possible rewards are blocked off from me. And so even though I don't have a four and a five, no big deal. My lowest value is a three, meaning I could get one good, I could get two fuel, I could get rid of one interference token that I may have, or get five bucks. What I cannot do is get two fish or be able to buy a card. But maybe I had a one. And if that's the case, then I can choose that and choose any of those. Buying a card, all the others are pretty self-explanatory. Buying a card is pretty simple though. You're going to draw the top two cards off the deck and then you're going to check, uh, choose to purchase one of them for the face value that's on that card, be it three or five dollars in this case. The other card will go back to the bottom of the deck and then you're going to immediately place it somewhere in an open harbor space, again paying any dollars that you will owe for any gaps left to the left. That's purchasing the card that's getting rewards. Any questions? No. Nope. Nope. Okay. The last thing here for the preparation is setting new turn order. Each player then totals the pip value of all five dice. In this case, I'm looking at 19. The highest number is going to go first. Tied players remain in relative position. We're going to exchange turn order cards to represent the new turn order. And then the first player also receives an interference token. Again, those are prohibitively uh, worth or it cost you a bunch of points as the game goes on, or at end game scoring, I should say. So just be aware of that. That's the end of the preparation phase. Now we get into the meat of the game, which is third phase, which is the action phase. So beginning with the new start player, players are going to take turns using their dice to take one of the three available main actions along with any number of free actions. When they're finished with their turn, they say as much, and then the play moves to the next player in turn order until all players have used all of their dice. Any players who have no dice left or skip, this is really important. If you have no dice, that means you have no actions, which means you also cannot do any free actions. Okay? That makes sense? Yep. That's important. So, what are the three actions? First off, we're going to start with the middle one because that's that one's really, really simple. It says, take fish, discard any number of dice to the discard area and receive one fish for each die discarded. The pip value doesn't matter. So maybe I choose these two threes. I go ahead and add it over here. That was two dice. So two dice means I'm then going to take two fish and add it to there. Boom, that's the end. I can also do any mix of free actions as well. All right, the second action is bidding on a card. And now you're going to see why we're using colored dice for this. Place any number of dice on a single card as a bid to purchase the card at the end of the round. So let me go ahead and give an example here real quick. If you give me a moment to set something up. All right. So let's go back and let's take a look at this card here. So you'll see that Andrew on a previous action had bid. Jess had bid even before that. On my turn, I can choose any number of dice that I have at my disposal to be able to bid on that card. The pip value is going to determine the winning bid at the end of the round, but when bidding, 
the total number of dice that you must place must be equal to or greater than the bid with the most dice. So in other words, so even if this were something, and I'm not saying this would realistically ever happen, Jess will have had to have placed first. Then Andrew will have had to have placed because you must meet or exceed that quantity of dice, even if the value is lower. In this case, if I wish to bid, even though six is higher than two, which is also higher than three, the quantity of dice that has the most out here is two, which means I must bid a minimum of two dice regardless of the value. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. Yes. All right. In subsequent actions, you can bid on a different card or add to an existing bid. So maybe Andrew adds to this and maybe he and I get into a bit of a bidding war or maybe on my other action, maybe I come over here and I bid on that card, et cetera, et cetera. Does that make sense? Any questions on bidding on a card? Mm -mm. Nope. Okay. So the third available action then is activating a hub or a card effect. And I've kind of already touched on this a little bit, which is placing a die that meets the criteria on a hub or card activation space and immediately gain the pictured reward. So in that case, to be able to go here, I would have to have a two value die or a one value or a one value or a one value in that case. Well, I happen to have a one. Now I could adjust it, but we haven't talked about those yet. So maybe I come over here and I place that one value die. I would then get one fuel into my supply easy enough and boom, done. That's the third action, all right? One die per space, per round, and ships can travel to the same space. If that happens, the ship will then get whatever that is, or if the ship went there first and then I place the die, I will get whatever it shows there. But in addition to that, the first time they meet like this, I'm also going to get one fish added to my supply. If another ship comes along, and now there's two ships on that space with a die, the ship will get that, but I will not get an additional fish. Okay? Cool? Yep. All right, so that's the three main actions that are available in the game. Let's go ahead and talk about the free actions now. So before, during, or after a main action, you can take any number of free actions as you wish, limited only to your ability to do so. This is why it's suggested to say, quote unquote, I'm done when you're finished with a given turn because you can mix and match these for quite a while. Oh wait, no, I'm done. Okay, it's your turn. So try and, try and be cognizant of doing that. So let's go through what these are. Exchanging two or a fish, meaning discarding a fish, to get two bucks or fuel. And again, you must have the space in which to be able to store the fuel. Even if you're immediately going to spend it on a different action, you have to have the space to store it first. Not going to belabor that. That's pretty simple. The next one is if you have three or more fish, for you can discard these fish, then come over and choose any, and it could be, and I do mean any, discarded die that is over here, because remember, normally these are blue dice. You can choose any die over here to be able to have an extra action. This is the only action that is limited to once per turn. Everything else you can mix and match as much as you want. But if I did that, if I still, if I at one point had six fish and I just spent three fish to get that, when it becomes my turn again here, I could spend those three fish and take another die to be able to then add it over here. But it's once per turn you can do that. I wish there was a little times one to show that. Next action is spend five bucks, get rid of an interference token. You got 20 bucks, just burn in a hole in your pocket, you can get rid of four of them. Act yourself out. Because again, those are going to score points negatively at the end of the game. I had mentioned acquiring more ships. Well, they do cost three, five, seven, and then two for everyone after that. So three for your second ship, five for your third, regardless of what harbor you're going to be placing that in. I also mentioned you can buy harbors. Well, 5, 10, 15, or 20, your total of five, so that's the max that you will pay when you build harbors, okay? And again, remember, buying ships is only limited by the number of harbors that you have per shipping lane, okay? Next action is spending one fuel 
to be able to adjust your dive up or down one pip. So again, if I had some fuel here and I really wanted to be able to go to this spot, but I didn't have any twos, I could spend one fuel, turn that one into a two, and now I can go ahead and place it on there and get myself four bucks for doing so. Also, I should point out that sixes can wrap to ones and ones can wrap to sixes, so they work in both directions on that. Next, I've been talking about moving ships, but I haven't talked about how. Well, this is how. You spend two fuel, as many as you want, remember you're limited to eight here, to move your ship one space. So it'll start here. I could spend two fuel and advance this, and when I do so, again, I get four bucks because it went onto that space. Boom, done. I could do that any number of times, any mix, but remember ships only move to the right, okay? And again, each spot is unlimited for the number of ships that are on there. The last action are goods. So if you acquire goods, and there are some cards in which when they go onto there, they activate, the, they get goods. And let's say I had that. At any point, I can take any goods that are here and place it down here into the good spots on ports. And again, these must be filled top to bottom, left to right. And then the next one I fill, anytime you cover some sort of bonus, you get that bonus. That's, that's pretty much the entire game. Now let's talk about the rest of the round, which is uh, resolving bidding and scoring. And then we can start. So after the last player has placed their, or used their last die, the players then move into the end of round phase, which is phase four. So then we go into resolving bidding on the cards. So let me go ahead and put that example back out here. And let's say it ended up like so. So the cards resolve, advance cards first, top to bottom. So if any of these have resolved or have bids on them, we'll resolve those first. Then we go in kind of a Z pattern. So top row, left to right, middle row, top to, uh, left to right, and then bottom row, left to right. So any cards that don't have bids on them, ignore. Then we get to resolving the bid here. Losing bids, so I have a value of 10 versus 2 versus 5. Well, red and green each have losing bids, which means for every die that you have on a losing bid, you're going to get one fish. So red would get two fish in that case. Green would get one fish, and they would take their dice back like so. These, however, now I have a choice. I could spend the 5 bucks to be able to purchase this card or not. If I choose to, I put it immediately into my harbor. And I do mean immediately. You can't wait until you get other cards. So any gaps, again, you're going to pay a dollar for any gap. Whereas if I choose not to purchase this card, I get no, no consolation like the losing bids did. I had the opportunity to buy the card, but I did not. So in other words, the card will just go away. That's for resolving the bids. Okay. Then we will move on to the next card that has bids on it. The last thing that we do is prepare for the next round, which is each player gathers up all six of their dice. Ships uh, on top of dice stay on hubs. So in other words, if I had a die here and a ship, I would just take that and the ship would stay there. Then we're going to wipe the card display and deal out the next cards for the current round deck. So any cards that are here would go away. These advanced cards will stay there until they are purchased. And then if it's an end of a period, we go into mid-game scoring. So mid-game scoring is pretty simple. We're going to go into these tiles right here. Take a look. Whoever has the fewest interference tokens scores three points. Whoever, If anybody has at least five goods, and five goods meaning on port cards in their tableau, or so here and here. So if you have at least five, you would score the three points there. And then that we would turn those over and boom, that would be mid-game scoring. Then we'd go into the second period. Okay. There is one other thing for uh, mid-game scoring, I apologize, which is ship travel scoring. So if my ships ended up like here, this ship would score four points. This ship would score one point for a total of five points for that. Okay. Easy enough. Okay. If both of these ships were there, I would have scored eight points. All right, moving on. So at the end of the second mid-game scoring and before moving into final scoring, 
Each player, in turn order, may spend any remaining fuel and goods to move their ships and fill their ports. So, remember, this will not score unless a ship has moved past it and all the goods are there. So maybe at the last round, I have goods, but I forgot to place it. Well, you know what? Now I can go ahead and do it, and it will convey any benefit that it does. So in this case, I could then spend four fuel to move that to be able to score the 14 points at the end of the game. If one of my ships was back here and I moved it to there, I would then get one more fuel because that's what triggered it. And then, oh, hey, I could then there spend those two, get one back for moving on to that space. You do not have to do that because there may be some sort of endgame scoring card or something that's in your harbor in which you may not want to do that, but otherwise you are free to do so before we go into final scoring. And final scoring, here we go. We're going to score the number of harbors that, uh, that are open. So in this case, if I have two harbors open, we're going to look at this. That says I would score three points. Then victory points as shown on the bottom right of each card in a player's harbor. So in this case, I had at least one ship going through every card because this one made it to the end. Means I would score three, five, this is full, which means 12, 13, 14 points for that. Then we would score any cards with any end game scoring icon on it, which is this one. Important to note, you do not have to have a ship go through this card to get that. But you do need a ship to go through the card to be able to get that one, okay? Then you're going to score one victory point. If you have any goods that are left on your board, you will not score any points for any goods that are on cards themselves. And then you're going to subtract points based on however many interference tokens you have there. Most victory points or penguin points wins. Then most coins is the first tiebreaker. Then turn order and that is a pleasant journey to Neko. Cool. So there we go. Any questions?